Ever get that feeling where you know you know something, but you just can't pull it out of your brain? Like it's right there on the tip of your tongue. Oh, yeah. We've all been there. Well, today we're taking a deep dive into memory. Okay. But specifically, um, how memory works differently for a lot of people on the autism spectrum. It's called broad memory difficulties. And it's way more than just forgetting where you put your keys, right? It, it really impacts how people learn and take in information and even like everyday stuff. We're talking like struggling to remember past events. And I don't just mean dates, but like whole conversations, those little details that really bring back a memory. So it affects not just remembering the past, but learning new stuff, too. That's got to have a big impact on school and jobs and even relationships. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And even things like if you're trying to follow a recipe or put together furniture, those multi-step instructions, it can be really tough. And that's one of the things that's really interesting about the research we're looking at today. It's all this stuff about like a memory toolkit, strategies to really help with these challenges. Okay, so let's open up that toolkit. I'm always looking for ways to improve my memory. What's the first thing we should grab? Well, one of the papers we have, Unlocking Potential, a guide to supporting autistic learners. It talks a lot about visual aids. Like, you know those mind maps? Yeah. It's not just a cool picture. It's a way to visually link ideas together, which can be so helpful for remembering complicated information. I'm a very visual person, so that makes a lot of sense to me. I bet even if you're not specifically a visual learner, having a good diagram or a chart can make things way easier to understand. What else is in this memory toolkit? Another good one is, you know, routine and structure. Yep. Our brains, they really like patterns. So when you have a regular schedule, it actually frees up your brain to focus on what's important. You're not using up energy making decisions all the time. You know about every little thing. Like how I make my coffee every morning. It's practically automatic, which lets me think about other things while I'm doing it. But what about those times when you just can't remember something, no matter what you do? Oh yeah, for sure. There are things you can try. There's a whole chapter on this in Memory Mastery for All, Practical Techniques. It's all about mnemonics. You know, those little tricks. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have September. Right, right. It totally sticks with you. It's like you're using your brain's natural love of patterns to help you remember. And there are tons of different mnemonic techniques out there so you can kind of find what works for you. That's cool. I love that idea of like tricking your brain into remembering stuff. But what about like using technology? Our phones are basically like extensions of our brains these days. Yeah, totally. Calendars and reminders and note-taking apps, they're all about taking the load off your memory, like having an extra brain out there. It is kind of like a personal assistant in your pocket. But some people like to keep things old school, you know, pen and paper. What about them? Well, there's a paper here called Back to Basics, Strengthening Memory Through Practice. And it really stresses good old-fashioned repetition, just like learning a new language. The more you do something, the more likely you are to remember it. So flashcards and stuff like that, even just talking about what you've learned. Exactly. It's about actively using the information, not just kind of passively reading it. This memory toolkit is really impressive. But as we got deeper into these sources, I found this topic that, honestly, I was surprised by. A few articles talk about something called religious trauma syndrome, RTS. And specifically in the autistic community, I'm curious, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's a tricky topic. It's about how certain experiences, especially within you know some religious groups, can really impact people's well-being long term. And thinking about it, there's often this pressure to conform, sensory overload, and like fear of punishment. It's already a lot for anyone, but especially someone on the autism spectrum. And that's why it's important to be really careful talking about this. It's not about judging anyone's beliefs, but just recognizing that some experiences in religious settings can be traumatic. Yeah. And that can definitely make memory problems or any other mental health issue even worse. It sounds like a like a domino effect. You've got these memory challenges and then you add the stress and anxiety from these experiences and it all kind of snowballs. And it brings up this thing I've been thinking about as we go through all this research. OK, it's bigger than just memory. It's about like really getting what it's like to be autistic, you know, beyond just one symptom. And there's this term high masking that I'm not totally sure I understand. So high masking is when someone on the spectrum has gotten really good at hiding their autistic traits. Mm. So they might seem neurotypical, but think about the energy it takes to constantly monitor and adjust your behavior to fit in, you know. That sounds exhausting. It must be like carrying around this invisible weight all the time. Yeah, it's really interesting. And it shows how 
different everyone's experience on the spectrum can be. It's not just about different abilities, but different ways of being in the world, mm. which is a perfect way to move on to the next part of our deep dive. It's amazing. You know, we've been looking at how memory challenges play into the whole autistic experience, but these sources you found, they really show you just how big and diverse it is. It's like you step into this uh, this huge landscape with, you know, articles on things like autism and poverty and the justice system, even connections to like psychic abilities. It really flips the script on those limited views people have about autism. It's a lot to take in all these different topics, but I think it's so important to recognize that diversity, to get away from those like those old ideas about what autism is supposed to be and how it affects people's lives. Yeah, for sure. And that's what makes this collection of research so interesting. Like there's this article on um Autistic women in entrepreneurship, breaking down those barriers and going after what they want. It shows you how much potential there is in the autistic community, you know, potential that people don't even see a lot of the time. It's like we get so focused on the challenges and what people struggle with that we miss the strengths, the unique ways that autistic people see things, which actually leads to something else that I found really interesting. Uh, it's called the Autism Mafia. <laughs> I have to admit that name kind of threw me off. What's that all about? So Autism Mafia is... Well, it's kind of a controversial term. It's sometimes used to describe like these groups within the autistic community that try to like control the whole conversation about autism, like who gets to decide what it means to be autistic. It shows you that there's this tension, like in a lot of groups, a well, tension well. between, you know, individual choice and group identity. So it's like who speaks for the autistic community? Is there even like one unified voice when everyone has such different experiences? Yeah. Those are the questions that these researchers are trying to figure out. And it's a good reminder that even when you have a community where people share, you know, some common ground, there can be disagreements, different opinions. It's actually good to have those tough conversations, I think. Definitely, because it all comes down to respecting individual choices, right? Like if someone wants to call themselves autistic or how they handle their symptoms, what kind of help they need, even if they think autism needs to be like cured. Those are personal choices. And I think these sources do a really good job of showing you all those different sides of the conversation. For sure. And that kind of leads us to this whole other level of complexity about, you know, how society views autism and the systems in place. We talked about high masking earlier, but there are other ideas, too, like internalized ableism and autism supremacy yeah. that tell you something about, like, the power dynamics going on. OK, break those down for me. I know what ableism is, but internalized ableism, what does that mean for autistic people? Well, internalized ableism is when... Um, someone with a disability, so in this case, someone who is autistic, they start to believe the negative stuff that society says about disability. Yeah. It can lead to people feeling ashamed, you know, like they're not good enough, and they might not even ask for help when they need it. So it's like all these bad messages from the outside world get in, and then people start to believe them about themselves. That's really sad to think about how that could hurt someone's self-esteem and, you know, their mental health. It's definitely a barrier. It shows you that we need to change how we think about disability as a society, but it also means that it's super important to create communities where autistic people feel accepted and supported so they can be themselves. And what about autism supremacy? Is that kind of the like the opposite of that? Yeah, in a way, autism supremacy is the idea that autistic people are actually better than non-autistic people. Like there's this focus on how autistic traits like uh, being logical, systemizing, paying attention to detail, those are somehow more valuable. It's like both internalized ableism and autism supremacy. They try to put people in boxes, you know, mm. creating these ranks based on your brain. It's like we need to move away from these ideas of good and bad, better and worse, and just recognize that everybody has strengths and weaknesses no matter how their brain works. You got it. It's about recognizing that neurodiversity is just part of being human mm -hmm. and celebrating those differences without creating new um new hierarchies or whatever you call them. Inclusivity, not exclusivity. Exactly. And this whole discussion about power within the autistic community and in society, it leads to a really big question, hmm. a question that all these sources seem to be wrestling with. What's the question? How do we build a world that actually values and celebrates neurodiversity? Not just tolerating it, but seeing it as a good thing, something that brings strength and new ideas and makes the world a richer place. That's a powerful question. And I think it ties into everything we've been talking about, like understanding how other people experience the world, how they deal with the challenges, and also valuing their strengths and their perspectives, and then using that understanding to make the world a more inclusive, fair, and compassionate place for everyone. 
It feels like we've just scratched the surface here, though. You know, it's really interesting. We've talked about how big and diverse the autistic experience is. And I think one of the areas where that really comes into play is relationships. Some of these sources really get into like how autism affects dating, marriage, even divorce. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, one of the things that really stands out is how important communication is in relationships where one or both partners are autistic. Okay, so communication is always important in relationships. But I'm guessing it's even more so in this context. Right, and it's not just about like the words you say, it's about understanding those nonverbal cues, you know, body language and stuff mm. and recognizing sensory sensitivities and realizing that people might process emotions differently. So it's like learning a new language almost, a new language of love. Exactly. It takes patience and understanding from both sides. The research really highlights, you know, the challenges people on the spectrum might have in social situations, like how to show affection or understanding those unwritten rules of dating. You know. Yeah, those unwritten rules can be tough for anyone. But I guess what might seem obvious in a like neurotypical relationship might need a totally different approach when autism is involved. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Like being really direct with your communication, setting boundaries. And sometimes it's really helpful to get advice from a professional, yeah. you know, a therapist or someone. But in the end, it's about like finding a way to be together that feels good and supportive for both people, mm -hmm. which is going to be different for every couple. Makes sense. Okay, so we've talked about relationships. What about work? We touched on how, you know, the typical workplace can be difficult for autistic people. But there were also these really cool stories about autistic entrepreneurs, people who found their own way to be successful. What were some of the things that stood out to you there? Well, it seems pretty clear that the whole, you know, nine to five open office thing, yeah. it can be a nightmare. The sensory overload, all the social stuff, and just like, rigid structures that don't really work well with, you know, how autistic people process information and get things done. It's kind of ironic, right? Like that environment is supposed to be for productivity, but it can actually make things harder. Yeah, totally. And that's why it's so important to think about accommodations, being flexible, and even looking at different kinds of careers that, you know, play to autistic strengths, yeah. like that attention to detail and thinking things through logically. Right. We saw examples of autistic people doing really well in fields like uh, tech and science and even the arts, where those strengths are actually really valuable, it's a good reminder that success can look different for everyone and we need to create more space for neurodiversity. I totally agree. We should be focused on those talents and that potential instead of what people can't do. When you create a truly inclusive environment, everyone benefits. Okay, so we've covered relationships, careers. I think it's important to talk about mental health too. We already discussed religious trauma. But the sources also talked about like anxiety, depression, and burnout, especially as they relate to autism. What did you find most interesting about that part of the research? You know, it really struck me that um, for autistic people, those mental health challenges can be different than for neurotypical people. All the sensory stuff, social anxieties, and even just the effort of masking all the time, you can really take a toll. It's like all those underlying challenges make people more vulnerable to mental health issues, right? Yeah. Especially if they don't have the support they need. Exactly. That's why it's so important to create environments, you know, at work, at school, and in families that are really sensitive to those needs. There were a few sources that talked about how therapy and medication and even things like mindfulness can be really helpful. But it seems like finding what works for each person is key. Yeah, there's no magic formula. It's about giving people the tools they need, like maybe it's sensory regulation techniques or social skills training, or even just having like a solid group of friends and family who understand. It's about realizing that, you know, mental health is just as important for autistic people as for anyone else. This has been such a fascinating deep dive. It feels like we've really peeled back the layers of the autistic experience, memory, relationships, work, mental health, and so much more. If we had to sum it all up, like, What's the main takeaway here? What's the thread that connects all these things together? For me, it all comes back to understanding, really getting how autistic people experience the world. You know, the challenges they face, but also all the amazing strengths and unique perspectives they bring. And then using that understanding to create a world that's better for everyone, a more inclusive world, a fairer world, a more compassionate world. Well said. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Knowing something is important but it's what we do with that knowledge that really matters. Listeners, I hope this deep dive has made you think and maybe even challenged some of your ideas and maybe inspired you to keep learning about the world of autism. We're all on this journey of understanding together, and the more we learn, the more connected we become. 
So until next time, keep those questions coming, keep your minds open, and keep celebrating all the amazing ways that people experience the world.